Mighty God, I thank you for my brother. I thank you, Lord God, for his love and his part in my life. He has helped to make me, Lord God, the man that I am today. I thank you, Lord God, for his love and demonstration, his love for your word and his love, Lord God, for your people. I thank you, Lord God, for the word that he will speak to us today. Our hearts are postured to listen, Father, uh, in a double portion type way, twice as much as we would listen at other times. We thank you, Father, and we thank you, Lord God, for the word coming forth from him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> okay. Am I good on the mic? Do I need to change anything up? Let's see. Oh. Um. Is it better? Yes. Yeah. 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 All right. Your pastor is very gracious. Uh, truth be told, uh, the Arising Church wouldn't be what it is without the Hutchinsons. Uh, their time there and their impact on the ministry, uh, from the oldest to the youngest of the family, including the kids, uh, they forever made an impression on us and on many people's lives. And uh, we are eternally grateful for them. And they have been just as much of a blessing to us, if not more and we have been to them and you guys. So we are humbled to be here. We are very grateful to be here. Got my wife, Lindy. You know Lindy? Oh, if you knew her like I know her, you'd be much more excited. <laughs> well, we are thankful to be here. You guys left a lasting impression on us. That was the biggest convoy that it came. To our church since a conference. So, y'all got to stay at Hotel Morrison. Yeah. 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 Yes. Pretty good accommodations, right? Yes. And everybody gets to stay together. Uh, your love for one another and the presence of the king is your reputation around the churches. I want you to know that. The way that you guys love one another, that's how people see you and your love for the presence of the king. That's how other churches see you. Sometimes you don't know. You're just living in your world right here, right? Y'all love the other churches, but the reputation that you have is loving one another and loving the presence of the King. And uh, you know as well as I do, John 13, 35. How do they know that you're His disciples? And your love for one another. And the best compliment that, uh, that I can get is when the people that, that I'm responsible for for someone to say, man, you guys really love one another. That's it. You've got it. And the Lord can change the world through that. He will change the world through that. We love the way that you guys love one another. Love I love the joy and the excitement that y'all have when you get together. Mm -hmm. And you should have joy and excitement when you get together. It's the best place to be on earth. I'm proud to be in the presence of disciples of Christ today. Amen. Do you want to be like God? Yes! yes. No, I mean truly be like him. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You guys remember the Remember series? Yeah. Can't forget that series. Yeah. One of the most beautiful revelations that I got from that series was as I looked through, and it wasn't something that was overt. It wasn't right there in your face. It was the fact that throughout this process, God actually made Moses like him. So in the whole Remember series, as you're going through it, it's like, all right, Lord, I'm remembering the first time that I stood in your presence. I'm remembering you delivered me from Egypt. You led me all the way. You've done all these wonderful things. I'm a son. I remember how I'm rebellious. And at the end, I'm pleading for you. to do. The, the whole point for me that I saw at the end was God successfully took a broken man and made him like him. So much so that his face was shining with glory. He was bringing the words down from the mountain to the people. He was saying, let me die so that they can live. He made a man like him. That was surprising to me. And he'll do the same with us. He'll do the same with you. He'll make you like him. So that your heart beats like his. Just like we were singing at the end. I want to see what you see. I want to hear what you say, what you hear. I want to be right next to you. I want to be right next to your heart. Yeah. Last week, you guys heard a fantastic breakdown on the gospel message from Genesis 24. If I'd have known that Devin had a message up from Thursday, I'd have listened to that too. <laughs> but this message was amazing from last week. Amen? Yeah. He is coming back for a bride who has made herself ready. She is dressed in the right garments. 
because she has been righteous. Sometimes we forget that when he returns, he's not coming back to a chaotic mess. You ever come home to a mess? You ever come back and say, what? What is going on in this house? That's not how he comes back. He comes back for a bride that's made herself ready. And he did a successful job as a bridegroom. I want to remind you of a few things that your pastor shared with you on the bookends of that gospel message from Genesis 24. He spoke of internal rest in the midst of injustice. That was something that he said and I wrote that down. Do you know what this feels like? To be treated unjustly in a moment, but to be at peace on the inside. This is really going to be the crux of what we talk about today, so I really want you to get this for a moment. Do you know what it feels like when someone is being unjust towards you? Now, typically, we'd be stirred up. They're being unjust towards us, and we're starting to get fired up, too. We're thinking of what our response is going to be, or our defense, or maybe we just walk away, isolate ourselves, never talk to that person again, or hate them, or want to cut them down. But do you know what it feels like to be being treated unjustly and to be at peace on the inside? One of the things that he said last week was, uh, you see justice everywhere and it upsets you. It troubles you. When you look around and you see what's happening in the world and you listen to what's happening in the world, does it upset you? Are you troubled by it? Jesus said, do not be troubled. This is also what your pastor said. He said, you see darkness creeping in and you think it's going to overcome. Do not believe that lie. The kingdom of God is rising. And he also said, I will not keep silent. He's quoting from the scriptures till her righteousness shines like the dawn. Her salvation like a what? Like a blazing torch. Come on, remnant church. The nations will see your righteousness. As I prayed for a word for you guys, I have not yet listened to this message from last week. I didn't know that Pastor Mike was saying all those things. But the Lord gave me a message today that is about how you act during injustice, during wickedness. How you're supposed to deal with the wicked that are around you. He said, just bring whatever the Lord is doing in your heart. So can I tell you, the Lord has already punched me in the face with this message. (laughs) And I would love to tell you that I am now victorious standing on top of it all, having figured it all out. No, but I'm I'm asking the Lord to search my heart and to make me like him. And I want this. I want it bad. And I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Do you want to get this this morning? All right. So let's look at Luke 18, 7 and 8. This was a passage that a brother brought me. And uh, you know how sometimes when we're studying, you're going through a bunch of passages all at once. You'd be like, you take this verse, you take this verse, you take this verse, right? And sometimes you can kind of zone out. By the way, if you get tired today, it does not offend me for you to stand up and walk around. Please. I see it as a sign of respect instead of taking a nap during the message. Just stand up and walk around. You will not offend me, I promise. Luke 18, 7 and 8 was one of these scriptures and a long list of scriptures that was being given. And it was read over and I was like, wait, 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 stop, stop. And I, I got, it was this moment where the light bulb came on, right? And you know, wait a second, that's, that's for me. I'm supposed to hear that right now. And it was like everything stopped when this was read. So this is a parable of the persistent widow. Are y'all familiar? Yes. She's a widow. Back during this time, that's a terrible position to be in, right? There's a judge who's wicked. It says he neither fears God nor respects man. And the widow is coming and saying, avenge me against my adversary. I don't know who the adversary is or what he did to this widow, but he did it to a widow. And she's asking for vengeance against her adversary. Do you have any adversaries this morning? Do you have any enemies? Any people that have done you wrong? Okay. Anybody? I heard like four voices. Do you have anybody that's done you wrong? Has there been anybody in your life that you can think of right now? Yeah, it's that person. Yeah. So the widow is crying out for justice and she keeps coming to him again and again and again. And this wicked judge 
is like, ah, to get her to leave me alone, I'm going to give her what she's asking for. And then it says in verse 7, because this was a parable, and it's meant to send a point home. So I'm going a wicked judge, a wicked judge, who doesn't fear God or respect man, gives this woman what she's asking for. It says, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. And that's usually where it stopped for me. That as I cry out to the Lord, he's not like a wicked judge. He's a good father who's going to give me justice. Have you ever cried out for justice against those who are doing you wrong? Lord, bring justice. You ever ask the Lord, Lord, I wish this person would get out of my life. I wish I didn't have to deal with this person anymore. You ever felt like that? Yes. I wish that these kind of people will just change because they drive me crazy. This person drives me nuts. You ever felt like that? Yes. And you're asking for justice. Lord, change them. Lord, get these people out of my life. But I never focused on this turn that takes place right here. He says, nevertheless, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What is he saying? He's saying, these people that you want to get rid of, these people who are frustrating you, who are driving you crazy, this wickedness that you see all around you, these things that seem left undone or unaddressed, don't worry about that. I'm going to take care of all that. The question really is, will he find faith in me, in you, in the midst of the injustice, in the midst of the wickedness that's going on? Will you be found trusting or will you be found losing your stuff because you just can't take it anymore? Do not be troubled. You may be thinking, yes, Lord, you will find faith in me. I will be faithful. What we're going to talk about today, as we dig into the scriptures, is how we deal with the wicked. Because the litmus test for whether or not you truly have faith is in that moment when you're being provoked in every way and wickedness is happening all around you if you stay at peace. That's how you know whether or not you have faith. Not now in this moment when things are cool. There's no threat around you right now. Right? Or maybe you're already not at peace because you're thinking about something that's not even happening right now. In that case, there's your answer. This is where he convicted me. Do you guys hate wickedness and injustice? Yes. You're not alone in this. King David longed for the same thing. He wanted to see justice done. You know that? God himself, your creator, longs for the same thing. Do you know that? God longs to see justice done and for wickedness to be dealt with. But what we're going to look at today is how you see wickedness and the wicked versus how you deal with them. Because you can hate wickedness and really abhor those who are breaking the law of God and not want anything to do with them, not want them to be in your counsel or to be affecting your life. You can have those feelings, but then the way that you actually deal with them when they're in front of you and this is happening real time, that doesn't look like you punching them and knocking them out. It doesn't look like you taking out a gun and ending their life. It doesn't look like you having nothing to do with them. There's actually a way we're supposed to interact with these right. people. Yeah. And that's what we want to learn about today. So we're going to do a little character study on David. And then we're going to look at our father. And then that's going to inform us of what we're supposed to do. Okay? So first, we're going to look at how David saw the wicked. So the message title today is Dealing with the Wicked. So how did David see the wicked? Bring up uh, Psalm 101. Don't turn there. It's like my laptop battery has got five hours worth of charge, so we should almost make it. 
You got a charger? Okay, we're good. <laughs> Look at verses 3 through 5. It says, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. Yeah. You agree with that? Yes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall be far from me. I will know nothing of evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. Man, these are strong words from David. Does it sound like David wants to be friends with the wicked? No. He just said, whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. So let's be honest for just a second. He says he's going to destroy them. What picture do you get in your head? Killing them. So let's be honest for a second. We talk about being soldiers in here, right? We talk about picking up our sword. Fighting until we die, till our final breath, and rightly so. Am I going to pick up an actual sword, take it to someone who is being wicked, and then literally kill them? I'm asking a legitimate question right now. Am I going to pick up a gun, a machine gun, and go and literally kill all the wicked people in the world? You see, sometimes we get that in our heads, though, that that's how I'm going to deal with these problems, is to eliminate these people, to get away from them, to have nothing to do with them. And so then when you encounter them, you don't know what to do because you've not trained yourself in how to actually fight a battle in that moment. Because can I tell you, there's a secret, it's at the end, I'm going to give it to you now. <laughs> Revelation 12, 11 says what? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. Yeah. Yeah. And we do not love our lives so much as to shrink from death. Yeah. Blood of the Lamb, power of the testimony. And. No. And we don't love our lives so much as to shrink from death. That's right. And death one time and a glorious martyr and a glorious martyring at the end of our lives? Is that the time that we experience death only? No, in a moment when you are there with the wickedness and the injustice happening real time, and what rises up in you, maybe in you, is I want to literally kill this person. I want to punch them in the face with my actual hand in their actual face. <laughs> And if you feel that rising up in you, can I tell you, that is not what a soldier of God does. Okay. If you let me know, if you want nothing to do with the rest of this message, you get a free pass right out there. But we can do this today. And we can get this right so that we treat the people out there, so that we treat them the way that we're supposed to, so that we learn how to lay down our lives even for the wicked, right? So David, he hates, this is what we're, we're trying to establish a point here. Psalm 101, look at verses 6 through 8. It says, I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. That's the kind of people I want around me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Morning by morning, I will destroy all the wicked in the land. Get them, David. Cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. Look at Psalm 94. Starting in verse 1. O Lord, God of vengeance. O Lord, God of vengeance, shine forth. Rise up, O judge of the earth. Repay to the proud what they deserve. You ever feel that way? I hope they get what's coming to them. I hope they get what they deserve. I know what that feels like. Y'all know what that feels like? Yeah. Oh Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exult? They pour out their arrogant words. All the evildoers boast. 
They crush your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and sojourner and murder the fatherless. And they say, the Lord does not see, the God of Jacob does not perceive. How about those people that are out there overseeing abortions? Mm -hmm. How about the homosexual community? How about the liberals? How about Muslims? Right? Does anything stir it up inside you? Lord, destroy them. Bring justice. I want them cut off from the land. What rises up in you? And maybe not in this moment because you see where I'm going. Has that risen up in you before though? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be honest with each other. I'm telling you, I'm laying my heart bare before you guys. Saying this is what the Lord is working on me in. Yeah. Right? We're going to do this together. Yeah. Does David sound like a man who wants justice against the wicked? Yeah. Yes. Yes. But how did David deal with the wicked? We're going to look at three men in particular that were wicked, undoubtedly wicked, that David dealt with. And watch how this man who hates injustice and wickedness, how he actually treated these wicked men. The first is Nabal. Now, I know all y'all been through marriage counseling. Your pastor's been doing a good job, right? Yeah. What does Nabal's name mean? Fool. Fool. He's a fool. So go to 1 Samuel 25. How did David deal with these people? It's like, I'm going to kill them all. As soon as I see them, I'm going to strike them down. I'm going to destroy them. Cut off their heads. Right? Look at verse 10. Your pastor referenced this last week. And Nabal answered David's servants, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Now, is that what was going on with David? Was he breaking away from his master? No, he's on the run for his life because the dude's trying to kill him. Yeah. And he's like, who is this? Now, you all remember what David did for the ball, right? He and his men watched over their sheep so they didn't lose any. So David had been kind to Nabal, actually done him a great service. And now how was Nabal repaying him? He's saying, who is this? And lots of people running away from their masters. Oof. Look at verse 21. This is how David saw it. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned me evil for good. You ever had that happen? You did something good for someone. You sacrificed for them. You gave of yourself for them. And then they were thankless. Maybe they even turned around and actually insulted you. You ever had that happen? Anybody? You can raise your hand. You ever had that happen? So how did David respond initially? What was he going to do? Kill everybody. Kill that man. And everybody in his house. And you're like, yeah, that's the Psalm 101 David that I know about. Let's go, David. And he's like, every man strap on your sword. Yes, right? A battle cry in the camp. Yeah, for David! Right? And then who comes galloping? Right? Thank God for Abigail. Thank God for Abigail. David was ready to kill him. Has your anger ever flared up in a moment like that? Man, I, I've been nice, and look at what you're doing. And you flare up. This is what happened to David. But Abigail changes his mind. Look at verse 28. Please forgive the trespass of your servant. This is what Abigail says. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. Because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. So what was the right response that David needed help with in that moment? Hey, forgive him. The Lord is making you a sure house and you, you fight the battles that the Lord gives you to fight. Forgive this man right now. And look at verse 30 through 31. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, 
my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause, or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. What was she trying to spare him from? What was the spirit-led woman of God trying to spare David from? The guilt that comes with you working salvation with your own hand. Because in a moment, has someone cut you down or done something to you, and then you actually retaliate, and you get them. And you know that you got them, and they know you got them too. And others can see that you got them. Do you walk away feeling good about yourself yeah. after that? Yeah. And Abigail knew David wouldn't either. Yeah. And she's like, I don't want you to walk away from this having pangs of conscience or having shed blood on your own, working salvation for your own hand. I don't want that on your conscience. That's what she's telling him. Yeah. So he does it. He tells his flesh... To shut up, this is what uh, Zach says, shut the flesh up. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so he does it. And then he washes his hands of the situation. I'm not going to take this in my own hands anymore. It's in the Lord's hands. And he's left with a clean conscience. He removes himself from vengeance and places the matter in the Lord's hands. And then look at what happens. Look at verse 39. <laughs> ah! Okay. This is real time, I'm telling you. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. He's like, you have to get that woman around me all the time now. <laughs> I'm going to need help with this many more times yeah. going forward. Yeah. David hates the wicked, right? Yeah. Yeah. But what did he do to the wicked here? Now, talk to me. What did he do to the wicked here? He spared him. Yeah. He forgave him. He backed away from him. said, this is, I'm not going to do to this man what he did to me or respond in kind or, or take this matter into my own hands and work salvation for myself. I'm going to back away. All right, Lord. He insulted me, but I'm your servant. So it's really an insult against you. So I'm going to back away from this moment. I'm not going to respond and engage in this foolish behavior. Right? Now let's take a look at Saul. Turn to 1 Samuel 18. God, man, insecure from the day he was appointed king. Anybody got insecurity in here? Was anybody afraid to say anything just now? That's also insecurity something. <laughs> but in the name of Jesus, he is driving out security. Look, that was the whole purpose of the Remember series. Securing sonship. But that's what we want. We want secure sons. Secure why? So that any threat can come our way. So that any insult can come our way. Anybody can come up against us. And we are secure and do not have to engage in a battle that the Lord is not asking us to fight. So Jesus said, when Peter struck the soldier, he not only said, put your sword away. Those that live by the sword, die by the sword. He said, shall I not drink the cup that my father has for me? Yeah. Do you know I can call on legions of angels to come right now? There is a reason I am handling this situation this way. I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, starting in verse 8. <laughs> and Saul was very angry. Why was he angry? Because they're singing David's praises. Saul's the king. Don't they know that I'm the man, not him? Why are they looking to him? It's me. I deserve the praise, the attention, the love, the glory, the focus. Not him, me. So he's jealous. He's angry. He's displeased. 
And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. He had a jealous eye, some versions say, from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul. Because isn't that the way that it goes? Starts off with you allowing the enemy in. I'm going to partner with the enemy a little bit against this guy. And boy, the enemy takes you much further than you wanted to go. Yeah. And that anger and that rage will overtake you, won't it? Yeah. God, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. As he did by day, Saul had his spear in hand and Saul hurled the spear for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. You know the story. Saul continues to chase down David, even killing innocent priests in an effort to destroy him, all because he was jealous. You ever had somebody jealous of you? You ever been jealous of somebody else? They either wanted what you had or didn't want you to have what you had. Skills, talents, blessing, favor. Or you felt that way about them. I want what they have or I don't want them to have it. I don't want it myself. I just don't want them to have it. I don't feel like they deserve it. <laughs> Wickedness. Look at First Samuel 24, 4 through 7. This is still Saul. So David's in a moment where he's finally got a chance to rid the earth of this wicked man who has tried to kill him time and again, who hates him without cause, who's slandering him, spreading lies about him, and wants to end him. And he's standing right there. Look at verse 4. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand. To make matters worse, it wasn't only a temptation in David. His brothers were like, end this dude right now. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Do you see what happened? Yeah. Did David know how to kill people? Yes. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> Here he was. With Saul, right now, I can end this suffering that I'm going through with this person. I can end this trouble that they're putting me through. I can get rid of them. And then my life will be better. Think how much better my life would be without this person in my life. And David doesn't, go, doesn't even go so far as to kill him or injure him. He just comes off a corner of his robe. And then what happens to David? He's conscience stricken because he cut off a corner of his robe. Something about even cutting him a little bit, even just the idea, I'm just going to cut him a little bit. I'm just going to cut just the edge of him a little bit. Even that idea, he's like, this is wrong. This is wrong. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be engaging. Guys, everybody leave him alone. Everybody back away. What is the equivalent of this? David wouldn't even cut off a corner of the road. For us, this may look like us slandering. Because what was he doing? He was showing Saul that he could hurt him. Yeah. I could hurt you. Exactly. Look at what I did. Right? This could have been you. Hmm. I spared you. He wanted to show him power. He wanted to show that he could hurt him. And that is not for you, saints. You are not to show and display that you could hurt somebody. To send the message. Send them a message. Hey, I want you to know that I belong to the Lord. 
But if I wasn't a Christian, <laughs> just know that that's in me. And have some fear if you keep coming against me. I want to let you know that I'm not always like this. So controlled. I can lose it. And you want to send them a message so that they stop messing with you. But David recognizes that what he did was wrong. That's not how I'm supposed to deal with this wicked man. David hates wickedness, doesn't he? But here is a wicked man. And he's conscience stricken for even the idea that he could hurt him. That's not me. I can't lift my hand against the Lord's anointing. I don't want to slander. I don't want to speak against him. In fact, even in Saul's death, David kills the man who brings him the news of Saul's death, and then he sings Saul's praises. Do you have that same mindset towards the wicked people that are in your life or people who are doing wickedness, maybe that aren't even wicked people? You see them as wicked, but there's just some wickedness that's present. Gandhi has a quote, maybe you're familiar with it, it says, love the sinner, hate the sin. You ever heard that? Yeah. It's not from church, it's not from Jesus, it's not from God. Love the sinner, hate the sin. But even that is taken out of context. The full quote is, love the sinner, hate the sin, proves to be a difficult thing. Because when you see them as a sinner, you tend to devalue them. So the full quote is saying, you don't even see, don't see them just as a sinner. Do you know, nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to love the sinner. It doesn't tell you that. It tells you to love your enemies and love your neighbors. But when you see someone else as the sinner, that puts them down here and you up here. But all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so when we want wrath and justice on someone who has the presence of some wickedness, the judgment that we are calling down on them will fall on us. Yes, this is what we're going to see. So David, after this moment, he shows us, gives us some insight into his mind. Look at verse 12. It says, May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. You need to make up your mind today. I'm going to stop being against this person, these people. You are not against them. You are for the Lord. This is what the angel told Joshua. I am not for or against these groups of people. I am for the Lord and I stand for what he stands for. If he is against something, I stand with him. But me as an individual, my identity is laid down. I am now hidden in Christ. I belong to Him. I've let go of my opinions, Republican, Democrat, liberal, all this, conservative. I belong to God. And so whatever He thinks, whatever He feels, whatever He says, that's what I want. That's how I want to be. How does He feel towards this person right now? And look at verse 15. It says this again. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you. And see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. If there is someone in your life that is being wicked towards you. Maybe in a moment. Maybe in a relationship. Maybe this happened in your family. You need to learn how to back away from it and say, may the Lord plead my cause in this moment. I don't sit here and have to defend myself, but the Lord plead my cause and judge between you and me in this moment. Right? Listen to the proverb that David's son wrote. You don't have to turn it. Throw it up on the screen if you got it. Proverbs 24, 17 through 18. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Just pause right there for a second. Don't rejoice when your enemy falls. 
Have you ever been, someone's been wicked towards you, been treating you a certain way, and then uh, he falls, or something difficult happens to her, right? And then you look and you're like, yes, serves her right. Serves him right. You ever felt that way? Yeah. Serves them right. Don't rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. When you respond like, yes, getting what they deserve. The scripture literally says that the Lord will be like, actually, no. And who do you think he turns against? You. Do you see how terrible this cycle is when you want him to do vengeance and justice towards everybody else? Yes, getting what they deserve. And he's like, actually, let me come to your house right now. You're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> but that's what he does. You're like, get them, Lord, get them. And get them, and get them. And then he starts to get them. And you're like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> he stops what he's doing and comes to you. Because you are not free from all of the wickedness that you should be free from. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Don't interrupt God bringing discipline and correction to someone's life by being happy about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't interrupt God when He's bringing discipline and correction to someone. Or he'll turn on you. Don't interrupt him by being happy about it. Amen. Let's look at Shimei. This is the last one for David. 2 Samuel 16. This is one of my favorite stories of David. This is what confidence and security looks like yeah. in this moment. This is, I would argue that this is David's lowest point in his life when he's experiencing this. His own son has betrayed him, taken the throne. He's walking away from the kingdom that he helped establish. He belongs there as king. His failures as a father, all the turmoil that he went through with Saul, everything that he's ever done wrong is all right in front of his face right now. He's at a very low point. And here comes freaking Shimei. <laughs> when King David, starting in verse 5, when King David came to Baharim, there came out a man of the family of the house of who? Oh. Saul. Whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. And as he came, he cursed continually. And he threw stones at David and at all the servants of the king of King David. He had his friends too. And all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Has this church ever had people throw stones at it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is the Horizon Church. Many stones. Big ones too. Big stones. <laughs> Using old medieval catapults. <laughs> it's tough when people start throwing stones at your friends. Yeah. Throwing stones at you is one thing. Throwing stones at your friends? Yeah. That's tough. This is what Shimei was doing to David and his friends. And Shimei said, as he cursed, get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul. Whoa, he's going there. He's going back, back to those days. He's saying that why this is happening to me and my son and all these people betraying me and taking the palace and me not having to leave. He's saying that all this is because of what I did to Saul. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. That throne belongs to him, he's saying. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son, Absalom. See, your evil is on you for you are a man of blood. So I'm glad this is Shimei now saying, I'm glad that this is happening to you. You deserve this. 
bringing up the old things, throwing stones at him and at his friends. And then Abishai. Oh, man. You got any Abishais in your life? Yeah. Sometimes it's comforting and fun to have an Abishai. So as Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over and take off his head. <laughs> David in this moment could have been, you know what? Yeah, it's about time someone paid. I mean, all this stuff. Yeah, take him out of Abishai. Boom, done. Enemy gone. No more curses, no more stones. He can wipe it out in a moment. Yeah. I don't have to hear these curses anymore. I don't have to hear him insult me and throw stones at me and my friends anymore. I can be done with it right now. Cut him down. And it wouldn't even be in my hand. Someone else would do it for me. But listen to how David responded. What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? If he is cursing because the Lord has said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? It's his attitude. He's like, hey man, I don't need any of that stuff in my head right now. I don't need to be listening to talk about cutting him down. Look, I'm trying to work through, if the Lord has sent him to curse me, then let him, let him curse me. David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my own son seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamin? Leave him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him to. And here's the turn for David. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me, and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing today. You had the opportunity when you were being cursed and insulted and stones are being thrown at you and your friends. You can end it by your own hand. Or you can say, maybe the Lord will see this and do us good in return. Yeah. So David and his men went on the road while Shimei went along the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and flung dust. Shimei was rejoicing at David's plight. David once again, did not return insult for insult, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. This is like Christ. Look at 1 Peter 2, 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. The fight that you're talking about, the soldier, the sword, the weaponry, the armory, the armory, all these this imagery, the battle, everything that you're talking about, the fight is to avoid going into the flesh. That fight, that grit, that determination, that strength, that willingness is to not go into your flesh and take salvation into your own hand. That fight, that determination, that grit is to say, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. And then setting your face like flint not on the cross, but on the joy that's on the other side of it and being willing to endure the cross Amen. if that's what it takes. Yeah, that's, right. that's the point of all of this soldier mentality and the standing strong. That's actually what we're going for. Not punching someone in their actual face or striking them down with an actual sword, or shooting them with an actual gun. That's not what we're going after. We are trying to lay down our lives. And the battle to do that is hard. While it is clear that David hated wickedness, the way he treated wicked men was to forgive them, to entrust vengeance to the Lord, to not slander or disrespect them, and to not rejoice when they fall. That's how David, who hated wickedness, treated wicked men. But maybe this is just a man. How does God see wickedness? Maybe David was weak in dealing with those men. Look at Psalm 45, 7. This is how our God sees wickedness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness 
beyond your companions. Look at Psalm 5, 4 through 6. It says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Does our God hate wickedness? Yes. Yes. Very clear language. He hates evildoers. He abhors the wicked man. But how does God deal with them? Look at Ezekiel 33, 11. We're going to rapid fire. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Right. Just sit on that for a second. I have, I don't want the wicked to die. That's what our God is saying. Do you forget that sometimes? That God does not want the wicked to die. That's not his desire. What does he want? But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? This is God pleading. Turn back. I don't want you to die. This is his heart towards them. Not a cold, callous, you're going to get what's coming to you. That's not what he says. That's not his heart. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked man forsake his own way and the unrighteous man his own thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion and to our God and he will freely pardon. Yeah. Maybe sometime you've been in a position where someone who actually did terrible things to you, said terrible things to you, came up and said, you know what, I'm sorry. I, re I really got that wrong. And then you're thinking, you're not going to get off that easy. After all that you said, after all that you did, you're not, I'm not letting you off the hook that easy. You need to pay for what you did. Not the heart of God. Let them turn that you may have compassion and He will freely... Pardon. <laughs> and look at John 3.17. Yes. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. Did you know that? Yeah. When Jesus came, He wasn't here to condemn everybody. Sometimes we dig into these conversations with the Pharisees. We're like, look at how He was hammering them. Look at how He was getting them. He was getting these people. He didn't come to condemn. But in order... To save. Yeah. Are you his bride? Yes. yes. Will his bride be found doing what he did? Yes. 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 Then are you here to condemn <coughs> the world? No. No, but that the world might be saved through your ministry. Yeah. Do you see this? Yes. We are going to do like our bridegroom does. And then when he returns, he won't find people who are literally mowing down the enemy. He won't find people with sword in hand who are chopping off their head. He won't find people who are able to beat up everybody else physically. What he's going to find are people who are laying their lives down just like he did. And then he's going to go, you got it. That's what I was after. That was the whole point of my ministry. That you would be like this. That you wouldn't fear death. And shy away from it, but that you would be bold and courageous to lay down your life for the wicked. Yeah. That's good. That they might be saved. The oppressors, those carrying out injustice, the wicked, he wants them all to turn, to live, so that he can show them compassion and pardon them. He's not looking to condemn them, but to save them. Second Peter 3.9 the Lord is not slow. You ever been like, hurry up, Lord, how long is this going to last? Get me out of this job. Get these people away from me. How long? You remember, the Lord is not slow 
to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient toward them. No. Forget. Patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish. You or them. You in the midst of your faithlessness, unable to wait well, wanting them to be struck down and judged, but that all should reach repentance. Look at what happened when God came down and took on flesh and dwelt among men to bring them salvation and rescue them. Matthew 27 is the best passage to look at all the ways in which Jesus provoked. And we're coming to a close here. Look at verse 22. I think everybody turn there, Matthew 27. I want you to know in whatever way you get provoked, in whatever way other people are mean towards you, unjust towards you, wicked towards you, whatever way that you'll experience, Jesus experienced it too. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tempted in every way and yet was without sin. So however you are being provoked in any given moment, you need to know that no temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And when you are tempted, he will provide a way of escape that is not just for porn. This is talking about when you are being provoked by other people as well. There is a way of escape when you are being provoked in a moment. And Jesus on the cross was provoked in every way imaginable. Look at verse 22 and 23. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. False accusations. Unjust suffering. Have you ever suffered unjustly? It's like, actually, I didn't do anything wrong, but people are treating me as if I did. Suffering unjustly. False accusations. You did this. You're a liar. You don't love the Lord. You're not acting like a Christian. False accusations when that's exactly what you're doing. They just don't see it. False accusations. Unjust suffering. Look at verse 27 through 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns. They put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand and kneeling before him, they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the... Has it ever been diminished by, in another man's eyes by what he's spoken? Jesus knows what that feels like. Look at verse 38. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And you see Shimei now multiplied, just walking by Jesus here. Oh yeah? You said that you would destroy the temple? This is now coming on you. Save yourself. Insulting him as he goes, even at his lowest point. So also the chief priests, the scribes, and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So now what happened to his friends, the disciples? What happened to them? Ran away. What about Judas? Betrayed him. What about everybody else? All the crowds that welcomed him. What are they doing? They want to kill him. How about the chief priests, the elders and the scribes, the people who should know better, the people who should actually be defending him, who should have seen all this coming in the scriptures and been there supporting him, mocking him? What about actual criminals on either side of him, mocking him? Soldiers who don't even know him or know what's going on in this moment. They're just there, mocking him. 
He is being provoked by every group of people imaginable, pushed in every way, every kind of evil that you can conceive of. It's all being directed at Jesus right now in this moment. Wickedness all around him. Surrounded by wicked men. Surrounded by Shimei's, Saul's, Nabal's, and every other kind of wicked man that you can imagine. And they're all surrounding him like bulls of Bashan, like dogs all around him. Wickedness everywhere. But then look what happens in Luke 23. I'm going from Matthew to Luke. Luke 23, verse 39. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other <laughs> rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed, justly, we deserve to be condemned. For we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Can I tell you, this is the moment. This is the reward of enduring wickedness and wicked men. Is that in a moment they'll watch how you are reacting. Because what is typical, what is totally understandable... That if you flip out and get in your flesh, if I were Jesus on the cross, I've thought about this. Probably what I would have done, boom, boom, come down. Then like, you see, I can do it. Okay? I could deliver myself if I want to. You said you'd believe if I came down. I came down. Now I'm going to get back up on the cross and I'm going to finish what I started. Okay? But I want to show I can do this to justify myself. But he didn't do that. And this criminal was watching him hang there and seeing the way that he reacted in the midst of all these wicked men. And he was listening to his response of praying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He's taking care of his mother. He's watching the way that he's being. Somehow in the midst of this torture, he's at peace. How does he have this internal rest in the midst of all this injustice around him? And then he says, I want that. Yeah. To his other friend, he's like, shut up. Shut up. Jesus, whatever kingdom that you're a part of, I want to be a part of that kingdom. Yeah. And then in that, you just won a battle. Yeah. You just slayed an enemy. Yeah. You just took the sword of the Spirit and you hacked down the enemies of God. Yeah. Yeah. In that, you just gave the enemy a beat, a beat down. That's what just now happened in that moment. As Jesus was hanging there, his blood falling out of him, being mocked and betrayed and provoked in every way. That's what we're after. That's the actual key to this, guys. And you're not waiting for a moment when you are hanging naked in front of the people you came to save and dying and breathing your last breath. That's not what you're waiting for. You're trying to recognize in a moment when the cross has come to you. That's what you're actually trying to do. In this moment, I'm rising. I want to defend myself. I want justice. But I'm remembering that Jesus did not cry out in that moment for justice, but forgiveness. Forgiveness. And someone saw how he was being in that moment, recognized, wait a second, they are different than him. The way that they are being is different than the way that he is being, and he doesn't deserve this. I want to be like you. And you're snatching people from the fire. Yeah. Look at Isaiah 53, 11 through 12. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. That's what I want for Remnant Church, for you. I want for the way that you live, for the way that you speak, and the way that you act, especially in the presence of injustice and wickedness, yeah. for that to bring many to righteousness. Amen. And he shall bear their iniquities. 
Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Did Jesus look strong while he's hanging on a cross? No, he looked weak and was dying. But in the heavens, in the eternal things, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Now we're taking it to a whole other level, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm not just saying, hey, I wipe my hands of the situation. I, I'm not going to be a part of this. The Lord take vengeance on you. Jesus steps it up. He actually makes intercession for those wicked men. Not just, Lord, deal with them, but forgive them. Don't count this against them. I don't want them to die in their sins. Isn't that God? Yeah. He doesn't want the wicked to perish. Don't let them die in their sins, God. Forgive them. He bore the sins of the unrighteous. That's you and me. He did it to bring us to God. And Hebrews 7.25 tells us that He always lives to make intercession. Yeah. So He's able to save them completely because He makes intercession. Yeah. Are you interceding for those people who are doing injustice to you? Who are doing wickedness to you? I mean really interceding. Lord, let them change. You know, Father, I just wish that they would see things differently and be different. <laughs> and... And if there's any way to let this cup pass from me, amen. I'm talking about real intercession that's born out of love where you see them rightly, where you see them like God sees them. That kind of intercession. Not this cheap, anything will do intercession. Real intercession. How do you think you're going to be towards them if what you've been sowing into that relationship by the time that you get in front of them is love and spirit-led prayer for their soul? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's going to change the way that you see them. And Jesus humbled himself and became nothing so that we wouldn't die in our sins, but to bring us to God. The most wicked and vile behavior from unjust men. And how did God deal with them? He forgave them. He served them. He prayed for them and made intercession for them. That's how God dealt with the wicked. He forgave them. He served them. And He interceded for them. But maybe, maybe you would say, well, that's just Jesus. No, brothers and sisters, in this you are wrong. What was described of Christ's actions? Being nothing and taking on the form of a servant and humbling himself to death, even false accusation. The Apostle Paul has this to say, Philippians 2, 4 through 5. Let each of you look not only to his own interests. The brothers from LCM, help me see. It's just saying, just look to other people's interests. Don't worry about your own interests. Look to other people's interests. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What mind? To become nothing. To become a servant. To humble yourself and be obedient to death, even death on a cross. Which is false accusation and being misunderstood. Finally, in 1 Peter 3, 8, this is where I want to end. 1 Peter 3 really drives this home because it's showing you that it is not just the expectation for Jesus. This is the expectation for you. It says, finally, all of you, starting in verse 8, have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. You remember this from Isaiah? Yeah. But on the contrary, bless. Yeah. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. 
For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil. Do you hear in this what David was learning? I'm not going to slander. I'm not going to speak against and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace, peacemakers, sons of God, who do like God does. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the days of the Lord are on the right, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. You want to see miracles. You want to see things you've never seen before. Start letting yourself die in a moment for the wicked to bring them to God. You're going to see him come through in ways that you never have before. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? We prayed for zeal this morning, right? Yeah. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And then hear this, our brothers and sisters who will go out on the streets. Hear this. Do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame like the thief on the cross. Yeah. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, because that's what it feels like, but being made alive in the Spirit, Amen. which is what we want. Yes. In John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Yeah. But in Matthew 5, 14, he says, you are the light of the world. Yeah. We follow his example concerning the wicked. Are you experiencing injustice? Good? So did he. You see a world full of wickedness? Good. So does he. People are insulting you, betraying you, mocking you, slandering you, disrespecting you, falsely accusing you. Good. David knows what this feels like. The prophets know what that felt like. Your heavenly father knows what it feels like. You want it to stop? It won't. You wish the wicked would go away and die? They won't. Because if God plans to deal, if His plan to deal with the wicked was to end them, you and I'd be gone too. His plan is to save them. His plan is to die for them. His plan for you is that you would die for them and forgive them along the way. Amen. The conquer by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. We do not love our lives even unto death. Yeah. We're going to stop waiting for the wicked people in our life to go away. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Hear me on this. Yeah. You have to stop waiting for the wicked people in your life or people who treat you as enemies to go away. They won't. Even if that particular person or people go away, someone will replace them. Mm -hmm. And God will keep this happening in your life for the rest of your life. I promise you that. Because He put you here to change things. He put you here in the hopes that you would follow the example of your Savior. Will there be a day when God finally comes and pours out on His wrath? Yes. But He already told you He doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked. So even on that day, that won't be where His joy comes from. It'll be in being joined with those who have left their wickedness. Yeah. But he will not be joyful about stomping out the wine press. Yeah. Why? Because he does not delight in the death of the wicked. Yeah. That's not a joyful thing for him. Yeah. What's joyful is that he gets to be with his bride. Yeah. Yeah. Cry for the wicked. Yeah. Pray for the wicked. Yes. Die for the wicked. Yeah. And in this you will represent the Father rightly yeah. to this world. I don't want you to say out the names of any people that have come to your mind. But if someone has come to your mind, if people have come to your mind during this message, just fall to your knees for a moment and repent before the Lord.
if the slanderers, if the false accusers, if the ones who have done wickedness to you come to your mind, then fall on your knees and repent and then begin to intercede and let wickedness be purged from you in this moment. It says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he was heard because of his reverent submission and his loud cries. I would challenge someone in this room to cry aloud for the enemies that came to your mind that you now need to love and intercede for. Cry aloud for them like his heart cries, like the shouts that came out of Jesus' mouth of intercession. to love our enemies, mm -hmm. then what's the point of us being here? We aren't representing him rightly because that's who Jesus was, the proof of God's love even for those who hated him. Yeah. And we are supposed to represent that rightly. That's what it means for us to be the light in this world, yeah. the light of this world, the light in the darkness. That's what that means, that we love even those who are unlovely. Because we were unlovely, yeah. and he loved us, yeah. and he still does. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Mighty God, we thank you for this time. God, I thank you for Remnant Church, who is a light in the darkness. God, in everywhere that I and that we have gotten this wrong, Lord, strengthen us so that what's said about us is the opposite, that they love even those who hate them, yes. that we are kind and gentle and respectful. But Lord, when it comes to the idea of laying down our lives, we are fierce and bold as lions and we do not run from death. We will put ourselves in a situation where we are heavily outnumbered and we will not shrink back from death. Yes. This is where the boldness and the courage comes in because we are bold and courageous even when we are faced with danger and criticism and threats. And we don't love our lives so much as to shrink from death. God, solidify this in our hearts and make us like you in this. We trust you, Jesus. Grow us in our trust. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.